which seeks to bring long duration storage that is 10 hours plus to a price point that is close to a tenth of lithium ion today. Preparing for this episode, I realized we actually haven't talked about electric energy storage for quite a bit. We might have touched it here or there, naturally, in one of the other episodes, but we haven't dedicated a full episode to EES for too long. So today, we'll make good for that. Now, of course, there's many reasons to install electricity storage systems. May it be economic efficiency, may it be integration of more wind and solar energy, provision of balancing power, overcoming grid bottlenecks, etc., etc. But one thing is clear, all of these various reasons create a market that is growing strongly worldwide. Actually, Bloomberg NAF expects an annual growth rate of 30% by 2030. So for this episode, we'll zero in on the world's largest storage market and try to learn from the developments there and see how they can be translated to the rest of the world. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Smartery Podcast, a podcast for and with the creators of the new energy world. A world in which energy will be renewable, decentralized and digital, bringing together electricity, heat and mobility. Let us show you how we will get there and who will get us there. My guest today is Sergio Duena. He has extensive experience in both the political and regulatory space all around the electricity, oil and gas industries. And currently he's working as senior consultant Strategien, where he primarily focuses on policy and regulatory efforts for the Californian Energy Storage Alliance, CISA. You might actually remember that last year we had a full CISA episode. So great to have you on board, Sergio. How are you doing? Yeah, thanks for having me. Very excited to share some of our experience in California with your audience. And actually, I also read in your CV that um, for one of your analysis, specifically around long duration energy storage, you were awarded the Smolensky Prize for Best Advanced Policy Analysis. So actually yourself set a quite high bar and my expectations are through the roof for this episode and your insights said you were um hopefully i can meet them <laughs> <laughs> so now that the pressure is up let's start with the first questions um give us an insight into one of the most exciting storage markets in the world namely california what developments are you currently observing there what developments are happening in the u.s and how do they differ to california uh, in california today uh, when i started this job actually back in 2018 we had under 200 megawatts of energy storage installed and operational in california uh, Today, we're over 4,200 uh, megawatts, over 4,000 megawatts. So very uh, rapid uh, acceleration of the deployment pace in California, mainly driven by our quite ambitious decarbonization goals. Uh, the state has set itself on a path to fully decarbonize by 2045, um, something that is uh, you know, way quicker than the pace of the rest of the country, although other jurisdictions have started having their own uh, decarbonization efforts and you know adopting their own regulation. So in general, uh, what we are seeing in, in California and in the U.S. as a whole is the cost declines in renewables coupled with you know um, more common decarbonization regulations, renewable portfolio standard laws out there have really spurred the need for storage. Um, we've also seen that, uh, the fossil situation, you know, now with, uh, volatility in the gas, uh, petrol markets as well, uh, that has put more pressure on electrification efforts. And in the end, uh, that really drives the need for finding a solution that allows us to more, uh, cheaply utilize all of the renewable energy that we're putting out into the grid today. Um, I would think, you know, that uh, a lot of this has been driven as of now by the electric power system, by that sector. Um, but now we're seeing demand from other sectors as well. Transportation, very importantly, uh, has put some pressure in, in demand here. And while the storage demand should be tech agnostic, uh, it's very likely that we'll see that multiple markets or sectors competing for the same type of solution 
that can drive diversification, right? And specialization among technologies. Right. Now that we have the picture um, in the US, um, how would you characterize other large storage markets worldwide? And uh, which ones are they actually? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that, uh, as I said before, really storage follows the opportunity of arbitraging energy, of moving energy from one moment in time to the other, or just using more of the energy that currently you might be wasting. In the case of if you have a lot of solar, you might have periods where there's just not enough demand. So if you could move it to a period of higher demand, that's way better. So in that sense, uh, what we've seen is that really the penetration of renewables, particularly those that are quite intermittent, Uh, largely drives demand in these big markets. However, this really definitely correlates with different needs. So, for example, um, some grids today are much more dependent on firm resources like hydro or nuclear power, um, conventional thermal generation, for example. Uh, those grids might require you know, storage that allows them to to sort out deficiencies that may occur for an extended period of, period of time. If you have a grid that depends a lot on hydro generation and you want to hedge against a drought, you don't need a battery. You need something that can help you out for several, several days, maybe even weeks. Uh, in other grids that are more variable, like California, Australia, different regions in, in, in South America that have experienced also a big growth in renewables, uh, mainly solar, there you need much more uh, daily arbitrage, you know, something that is much more diurnal uh, in, its, in its operation. And a similar pattern emerges when we look at uh, winter versus summer peaking areas. I think a key difference between Europe and what's happening in the Western U.S., is in the west of, uh, of the U.S., we are largely dependent on solar, so we will need a lot of daily arbitrage. But in Europe, on the other hand, a lot of the energy needs uh, are actually heat needs as well uh, that are very well served by gas or fossil fuels. And there, the storage that might be preferred could be something more centralized, like green hydrogen has uh, gained a lot of traction in those regions. Um, Or in Japan, where land is a very, uh, you know, scarce uh, asset. So largely what we found is uh, that uh, across the world, there is demand for something that can store renewable energy. The specific characteristics of the technologies will depend and, and vary very much with the use case that the region needs. For us, uh, that we've seen, We are still in sort of that daily, daily diurnal cycling. Uh, other regions might leapfrog that and go directly to, to seasonal needs. So the energy storage market depends on um, each country's energy mix and general approach. But um, could you, from the top of your head, um, name maybe the top three most exciting energy markets in the world currently? You mentioned Australia already. Is that also one of the largest markets? Yeah, I'd say, uh, well, within the U.S., definitely California is almost uh, a quarter of, of the demand there. Australia, very significant market. Um, in Europe for green hydrogen, I think there's a collective uh, interest there. And finally, China. China is really a player in the sector that has moved from almost a net supplier to now being a significant part of the demand as well. Well, that makes sense that China is part of that list. Now, we've talked about the markets and the developments. Let's talk about the technology. Which technical trends do you see in storage installation? Yeah, well, in uh, the US, across the US, what we've seen is a large uh, spike in interest in pairing resources, mainly existing renewables with uh, storage technologies. Um, this is largely due to tax incentives and also you know, some land use constraints uh, in uh, different geographies of the U.S., development of solar and wind, 
um, started and and sort of continued very aggressively. And now a lot of those locations uh, that could now be prime for storage development are being hybridized so that we have, you know, the ability to make sure that 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 storage is being charged from clean renewable energy while firming uh, that output and making it more certain for the ISO, um, for the system operator in general. Uh, other important trends that we've seen is there's a lot of interest in new ways of coupling resources, uh, particularly these that are inverter-based, like solar, wind, and batteries. While there's a lot of interest there because it could yield uh, you know, very important cost reductions and savings, let's say the the innovation in the technology side has been quicker than the innovation in the regulatory and standards side. Uh, we still need to catch up there to make sure that these new uh, forms of deployment that could yield significant savings uh, can actually be achieved while following all the rules and regulations. And finally, I think that there's been a, a a very significant growth in, in the interest of alternative technologies beyond lithium ion. So CISA, um, we are a membership based association. We have members all across the storage ecosystem and we are completely technology neutral. We have members that develop different technologies or that seek to optimize or integrate these technologies. And now with the increased demand for lithium ion, not only from the power sector, but also from transportation and other players, we've seen that load serving entities are really interested in how other uh, alternative technologies, long duration technologies can meet their needs. Also technologies that may not have thermal runaway issues that do not encounter uh, safety risks like lithium ion. There's a very important aspect to that for urban distributed deployments. And finally, at the end, it's really about driving costs down uh, to make alternatives viable. And in the U.S., the federal government has uh, started this commitment. They call it the long duration energy storage shot, uh, which seeks to bring long duration storage that is 10 hours plus to a price point that is close to a tenth of lithium ion today, because that will uh, really you know, spur very quickly uh, decarbonization if we achieve uh, uh, reductions like that. So definitely we're seeing more interested, uh, more interest in that area. Well, down to a tenth, that really would be a significant drop. That would be amazing just, um, yeah, for the financial viability. Um, but speaking of which, because you just said, you know, sometimes technology moves faster than regulation. Another issue is um, often with um, innovative technology is that somebody still needs to figure out the business model around it. So do you see some exciting new business models emerging um, for the storage deployment in the U.S.? Yeah. Well, uh, in California, we um, basically the biggest market operator uh, in, in the state, the California Independent System Operator, they've developed a participation pathway for storage resources uh, called this non-generator resource pathway, or NGR, as we call it. This has really become sort of a, an example across the industry in the U.S. as to how um, big front of the meter utility scale resources uh, that are fully uh, bidirectional, you know, they can charge, discharge, uh, do everything, how they can participate in the grid. Um, the CAISO has continued uh, that sort of innovation by creating other pathways now for, for paired resources, as I mentioned, like hybrid and co-located resources. Um, so we see that that is basically the vanguard today of participation pathways across the U.S. Other jurisdictions are uh, doing something similar, you know, trying to create their own their own frameworks. I think, importantly, the organized markets that are subject to the most, you know, stringent decarbonization goals, they have much more incentive to try to figure this out. Like in New England, New York, there's much more talk about it. Um, however, uh, there's still very important um, ways or 
very important products and services that storage can provide that we have yet to understand how to monetize effectively. And I think a key one here is uh, resiliency. Resiliency has been such a point of conversation in the West of the US and also in Australia, for example, with uh, climate change induced wildfires uh, being more severe every year. Um, Ratepayers definitely are interested in finding ways to be self-sufficient and to be able to keep having you know, the lights on regardless of, of any event. A difficult a challenge uh, in, in pricing or being able to monetize the value of resiliency really comes uh, to how each customer sees themselves and what are, you know, what is their internal elasticity in a way. What we see a lot in California is, you know, uh, customers that require, you know, uh, medical equipment or uh, something like that. There's the incredible willingness, of course, to work with the utilities and figure out how to maximize that resiliency value. But overall, uh, it's very disaggregated and very dependent on the type of end user that will see a value or, or not in having that backup. That's fascinating. Also, it was fascinating to hear that how like the Californian approach can differ from the approach in New York or New England, as you said, because I guess coming from other listening to this as a non-American, you know, you would assume your own country has one market and there's not many difference between <laughs> east and south and west and north. But in the US, it really is a lot of small markets with very different approaches. And I guess you have to go state by state. That's also an interesting takeaway already. You actually have your own upcoming initiative. It's called To Shape and Scale Storage Markets Across US West. So what is it about? And um, the name already says like it is beyond just California or a state. So it does include several states. Yeah. So as part of CISA, uh, we have created this new initiative. Uh, we're calling it a, a form of special project or special initiative called WEST, the Western Energy Storage Task Force. We uh, have approached this issue of um, how do we plan uh, regionally, comprehensively for the future of the electric system. And as you just mentioned, uh, in the U.S., we have uh, jurisdictions are uh, very much independent in how they regulate uh, or how they carry out their business. So what has occurred is that in in, in the Western U.S., each different load serving entity or state has their own planning process. And within those planning processes, it, it might be that they are not considering decarbonization or storage alternatives at all, uh, making it you know, quite easy to keep utilizing the legacy conventional systems rather than thinking outside the box and evaluating fairly these alternative options. So through West, our goal is to ensure that storage is evaluated properly and fairly in planning venues uh, so as to support future procurement of these resources and to support the market development in those states. Uh, We seek to share the lessons that we've learned in our own California work and make sure that other places don't commit the same mistakes we have uh, and that they don't need to trip in the same rocks so that that way we can make storage a mainstream resource across the region. Um, there's a lot of talk about re- regionalization and with decarbonization in the West, the resource shifting is a concern. So yeah, we uh, really want to uh, give as much as we can to these other jurisdictions and make sure that uh, we are successful in the region. So a lot of work that needs to be done to um, scale storage even further. Fortunately, we are already seeing a good growth. So um, currently, what are the main drivers behind purchasing energy storage in the US? And do they also differ from state to state? Yeah, that's a great question. I definitely think that they differ from state to state. In California, storage purchasing began through, uh, you know, direct legislative action, uh, AB 2514, Assembly Bill 2514, just directed load serving entities go out there and buy. And that really drove the market to uh, sort of connect buyers with sellers and better understand that 
Today, almost you know, 10 years after AB 2514, today I think the largest driver uh, for large-scale buyers is meeting their decarbonization targets while minimizing costs. That the only way to do so is with more renewables and storage of some form. For smaller scale, uh, scale buyers uh, like end users, the key benefit is being able to manage their bill and being able to have backup power and some form of resiliency. Um, we are uh, in this system, um, managing your bill uh, is very important. We have time of use rates in the state of California and we're moving closer and closer to real uh, you know, market prices being communicated directly to end users. Um, so this gives a lot of benefit. And as we're seeing, you know, fires and complications with the transmission system on the rise, uh, resiliency is becoming a key factor for end buyers. So that's interesting. So on the one hand, you might have economic considerations, uh, even uh, pro especially when going further, as you mentioned, and we might see technological advances that really let the price drop to a tenth. But now uh, you brought up resiliency, which makes sense with the wildfires. So is resilience and maybe the idea of self-sufficiency the same? Or is that might that be even another drive, driver that people just really want to have, you know, only depend on their own, which probably is a very American thing to do, I would assume. <laughs> I think as a non-American, I love the way you asked that question, uh, because it's very true that I think it's a cultural thing as well. Resiliency and self-sufficiency pose an interesting challenge to the system. First, because this is a system that has been based on collectivizing expenses uh, for it to actually be uh, economic, affordable to all end users. So the more participants that we have in the grid, the more people that are dependent on the grid to access their power, the, cheap, the cheaper the grid will be for everyone. But in recent years and with uh, a lot of climate change induced uh, complications, I think that there is a growing movement towards being able to not only isolate for your, your own needs, but to collectively in a community, a set of blocks, maybe a whole city, have its own microgrid. Those are very interesting technologically and uh, in a regulatory way as well. But it definitely will pose a challenge to the future of the grid as to where we're moving towards a bigger, more centralized, optimized apparatus like we see in regions that are, you know, expanding their interconnection, connecting with other neighboring regions or towards much more separate distribution level microgrids that coordinate between each other. That is pretty much the discussion uh, about the future. And in both of them, we will need storage in some form. That is super interesting. Uh, two aspects. On the one hand that you mentioned, this is not only about a homeowner just, you know, being independent by himself with having PV on the, on the rooftop and storage uh, in the garage, maybe connecting his car. But it's actually an idea that's bigger, that might have the scale of a block or a, um, a certain uh, yeah, street or district. That's quite interesting. Uh, and I never thought about it that, yes, of course, we always talk about the decentralized, you know, network and distributed network. But yeah, you're right. What we do not want to have is a disconnected network because then the whole idea of smart grid, et cetera, et cetera, won't come to fruition. And the whole um, load balancing of renewables, et cetera, et cetera, um, will probably not work. That is a really interesting problem that we actually have never discussed here on the podcast yet. So um, thanks for bringing that up. And I hope in another episode we can actually dive deeper into it. So as we speak here and record this episode, it's actually the 30th of uh, June. And um, just today, while reading the news in preparation also here for this episode, what was trending is that the US Supreme Court ruled that actually the EPA does not have the authority to impose an yeah, the energy strategy on the various states and um, to really rule out or um, force states to reduce the use of fossil fuels such as gas and oil. So what's your spontaneous um, opinion on that situation? No, you did not have much time probably to give it a lot of thought, but maybe you were talking already um, w about it with your colleagues. And how do you think will that affect America's Clean Energy Act. My reaction, first, I need to start by saying that I'm not a constitutional lawyer uh, <laughs> and that my thoughts are just mine. The Supreme Court decision sort of cuts to 
the role of the EPA and the discussion is whether if Congress bestowed upon the EPA the ability to set fleet-wide limits or regulations as they are trying to do so here. And the Supreme Court concludes that Congress did not bestow that authority upon the EPA. Uh, will this materially change uh, conditions across the U.S.? Uh, the answer, as it usually is, is it depends. Uh, it depends where you're at. I think in very uh, in the vast majority of states that have their own uh, renewable or decarbonization goals, the state legislature has already taken you know the actual uh, protagonic role of moving forward this policy. There are other states where, uh, you know, their own uh, leaders, their own uh, politicians will not do so because of different situations. And their federal action could actually help out, move the needle a little bit. So I think what this decision really means is that uh, once more, it will fall on the states, local leaders, and also local stakeholders to pressure their utilities, their own representatives and to make sure that change can happen at that level um, since it will be more difficult to do so federally. So that's quite interesting. So there we come back and uh, what came up earlier already that the US is um, a, quite a patchwork of uh, different legislations and states. So which might be a challenge but could also be an opportunity to actually balance out the Supreme Court ruling and I hope um, yeah the latter will be the case. So thanks a lot for this impromptu analysis of um, just this very recent day event. We talked about so many exciting things around the energy storage market. Um, let me just pick maybe three of them that I will take away with me. Uh, first up, we see great growth. You said it yourself, I think um, since 2018, in California, just up from 200 megawatt to 4,200 megawatt. That is really a steep development. What I think is very interesting as well is the technological potential in the future. You said um, we might get to a point where, for example, long duration storage uh, drops down to a tenth of the recent cost. And um, everybody can imagine um, how that makes storage even more attractive. And apart from that, I think there were two interesting points. One, um, resilience being a driver for energy storage. So specifically in California with wildfires affecting the grid, etc., etc., and the power supply. So people just use storage for more resilience. Uh, but another aspect that we never really discussed here is the um, growing importance of self-sufficiency that um, not only homeowners, private homeowners want to be self-sufficient, uh, but even smaller communities, districts or streets um, are going for self-sufficiency and that this actually on the one hand for storage is a good development, uh, but for the grid as such is a tricky development because it would sort of disconnect them um, from the grid, thus bringing about big challenges uh, when it comes to realizing a nationwide decentralized smart grid catering to the specific demands of renewables. So interesting development. Um, I hope we'll keep an eye on that here as part of this series. In the beginning, I said chokingly, the expectations for you are high because you come with big recommendations. Your expertise certainly did not disappoint, Sergio. So thanks a lot for taking your time today. Thank you. Pleasure uh, being here. And um, if you or you know any anyone in your audience, you'd like to learn more about the state of storage in California or elsewhere in the west of the U.S., please feel free to reach out. Uh, you have you have a lot of, of friends over here and would love to hear uh, about your, your questions and ideas. You can find everything about future-proof solutions for renewable energy storage and innovative battery technologies at EES Europe, Europe's largest and most international exhibition for batteries and energy storage systems. It's taking place from June 14th to 16th 2023 in Munich. All information can be found online at eeseurope.com. <music>